Hello, everyone. This is Dave Landry. Tonight, I want to introduce you to IPOs and talk about capitalizing on the promise of the future. And they really are a technician's dream. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for a little while, you probably know that you can lose money trading. I could sum it up real quick. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Um, not everyone here is familiar with me. I know there's some people that are coming in from outside. I'm not going to bore you and go through all this, so don't worry. You can get this bio off my website if you like. Uh, I've just been doing this for a long time, and I've written three books on the subjects that have been translated into seven languages total. Um, and there's some more information on me. Uh, again, as I often say when I'm giving a presentation to people who are new, uh, to either my methodology or me. A couple things, just real quick, I'm not going to go through all these, but one, it is not my way or the highway. Uh, if you have your own way of doing things and you are already successful doing them, then take what makes sense from what I'm presenting and add that to your stuff. Uh, no secrets or proprietary indicators. There's going to be a few things, obviously, I'm going to hold back on tonight, but I will give you enough uh, useful information that I think you can go out and at least get started with IPOs and have a good idea on whether or not trading them is right for you. Um, regardless of the methodology of whether we trade IPOs directly, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, quick scheme, he tried to say. One thing I often preach about probably too much is uh, there will be losses. And then the other thing, uh, main thing, is that there is a repeatability to what I do. A lot of people out there, uh, they're good traders, but if you try to follow them or mimic their methodology, you're going to have a very hard time doing that. Not to take anything away from them, but there are certain methodologies where your execution is very, very crucial. And as I often say, for lack of a better word, uh, with my stuff, you can get a little sloppy. Now, before we hop into the charts, one thing I want to talk about is there's the number one reason to trade IPOs is that they, they are a technician's dream. They seem to trade nearly purely on emotions. And if you think about what we're doing as technicians, as chartists, as people who use charts to make money, we're reading the emotions of the others and hopefully controlling our own to some extent and making these decisions based on that. And the beauty of the IPOs, these initial public offerings, is they do trade often on emotions alone. And I'm going to flesh that out in a few minutes. With technical analysis, there is a hard and fast rule. With fundamental analysis, there are no hard and fast rules. A company can make great earnings or have great earnings for 15 quarters in a row, could have 20, 30 percent growth during those 15 quarters, and there's no guarantee that that stock will go up. Greg Morris said that, um, I'm sorry, Schaubacher said that. The fundamentals suggest what a stock ought to do, but the technicals suggest what they are doing. And Greg Morris, the reason I'm getting him confused, he's got another good quote. And basically, he's saying that the market will only, uh, the trend will only bear what, the, fun, the great fundamentals will only bear what the trend will bear. I'm getting that mixed up. I'll have to look up that quote. But essentially, the market is the final arbiter, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in one second. Now, here's the hard and fast rule when it comes to IPOs. If B is greater than A and C is greater than B, then a market has to pass through B on its way to C. There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to fundamental analysis. Now, the beauty of IPOs is there are some patterns that I've discovered where you can pretty much buy at B. A little bit tougher at individual stocks. Every night in they'll set up just right at that B phase. But with the IPOs, it's a little bit more obvious and you could get in fairly quickly and early. They seem to either work or they don't. Now let's take a look at the last bull market in IPOs. Last fall I did a, or late last fall, I guess it was December, I did a webinar on stock selection, and I got very excited doing a webinar on stock selection when I started putting together my IPO stuff, and then I got really animated and excited. Everybody's like, dude, you were very pumped up when you got the IPOs, and I'm like, I know, and we're in this great IPO market, and I thought, 
I'm going to do something else with these IPOs. I'm going to do a webinar just on these IPOs. And then, well, a few months pass, and the reason I didn't do anything was like, well, I'm worried that this bubble is going to pop. I'm worried that this bull market that we're in is going to quit. Now, let's take a look at that last bull market from last fall. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time on these charts in the, in the longer webinar, but just take a look at these for now and see if you notice anything in all of these charts, or most of these charts, I should say. And you should notice a couple of things. One, there, there, there have been some incredible tradable rallies. Now, tradable is a key word in that sentence. In fact, this is one from the service. Look how textbook this setup is. Nice persistent uptrend and nice little pullback. It took a while to trigger. And one thing I'm going to touch upon in a few minutes is that part of the trading IPOs is you have to bend, but not completely abandon the core methodology, the core methodology being pullback in nature, trend in nature. Although there are, just to kind of give you a little teaser, there are some breakout characteristics in IPOs which makes them which make them excellent trading vehicles. That get in B part is what's got to be really fired up. But you can see that this has a nice pullback, nice thrust, nice pullback, nice thrust again. And then eventually it came right back in. Uh, here's another example when it took off. And yet another one that took off. Okay. Now, we kind of went through those quickly. And I don't know how long it's going to take your screen to catch up. And I promise I'll go much slower when we're going to, we're going to dig into these one by one and pick them apart. But you should have noticed that most of them fly and then they die, okay? Or at least the ones that I showed you, um, the ones I handpicked for you, fly and then they die. Now, that kind of leads you to believe that the current bull market is over in IPOs, but it's not. And that's one of the things that's like I kept putting it off, putting it off, waiting for it to end, and it hasn't ended. And that's why I said, you know what, the heck with it. I'm going to do the webinar on them. So let's take a look at some current examples. And then I'm just going to give the screen a second to catch up. These are all recent examples. These charts were put together within the last week or so. Some of them I did today. And you can see many of these stocks have had as much as 100% gains or more during that time. Now, what's kind of interesting is I got this email from Gloria, and she took a pattern out of my stock selection webinar when I got to the, the IPO section, and she took one of those patterns, and she saw that I was having an upcoming webinar on IPOs. She said, you know what? I'm going to start looking at these IPOs. I don't know why I didn't in the past. I mean, I guess that's what she's thinking. But when she saw that I'm doing a webinar, she's like, oh, that inspires me to go in and trade. And one of the stocks she traded was AGRX. And full disclosure, I am long with Gloria on this pattern. We both got long right about the same time on the same pattern. And we both made, we're up at least over 100% at one point in time, maybe only 60%, 70% now. But still, so far, it's been better than a poke and the eye and these type of moves are certainly possible this is repeatable this is very much repeatable in fact when you see some of the actual patterns you're not going to believe how simple they really are even if you do err uh, to trading so the other thing you know whenever you go to do a webinar or something you start thinking what if something changes and right now I'm all excited about this bull market we have and IPOs but what if something changes well so what if something changes I thought through this okay so if this was the last bull market in IPOs in the future there will be new fads that I can guarantee the other thing that's got me extremely excited excited is there's gonna be new technology every day there's new technology coming into the market. And it's not necessarily that it's going to come to fruition, okay, 
But it's going to be that promise of that new technology, that promise of the cure, the promise of the alternate energy source, the promise of comfortable exercise clothes, okay? So I think based on that promise, at the least there's going to be a lot of flies and dyes. And let me tell you something, that fly phase, a lot of those ones I just showed you with the fly and dye, some of those went 100% or more. And you catch a few of those, and you're going to have a pretty good year. Now, ideally, the ultimate goal is to catch that IPO and ride it forever. And that's going to be our goal. We always, we always, I hate to say swing for the fence because that sounds like we're risking a whole lot. We still go in and try to get a little piece like we normally do, try to get that swing trade out, try to get that initial profit and get that stop bumped up so we are at least break it even if stopped out in the remainder, borrowing overnight gaps. And then we're willing to sit it out and tough it out and ride it out for a longer-term gain. Now, worst case, of course, it gets stopped out at scratch. And in many cases, though, that fly phase, as I just said, could run as much as 100% or more. It's just absolutely amazing what I have seen over the last 10 years or so since I've been spending a lot of time studying these IPOs. So I really think that even if this bull market ends in the IPOs, even if the overall market begins to deteriorate a little bit and the speculation environment is not there, that's why I wrote a couple of days ago in the column when that AGRX we just talked about went up 50%, I wrote that speculation is alive and well. When you see a stock do that, and it had really good volume too, you know that speculation is alive and well. But even if that kind of wanes a little bit, I still think there's going to be a, enough time enough flies and dies to make it worthwhile. And that's going to end up being probably your bread and butter type of trade. What's the best time to plant a tree? Well, I'm going to save you from having to think about that. And this is the other thought that I was thinking when I decided to go ahead with this IPO webinar, even though we might be in the later phases of the bull market in these IPOs. But the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. That is the absolute best time to plant a tree. What is the second best time to plant a tree? And that would be today. So there will be upcoming bull markets, even if everything ends on July 13th, the day after I give my webinar on IPOs and how great they are and patterns and such. Even if that all ends, that great bull market that we're in ends, there's still going to be new fads. There's still going to be new technologies. There's still going to be great IPOs coming to the market. And if they're not within the next week, maybe within the next month or the next year. So having this information in your arsenal and being able to apply it is going to really help you out tremendously. Gloria, I'll pick it on Gloria a little bit, but Gloria kind of forgot about these things. And then all of a sudden she's like, hey, well, Dave's doing an, an IPO webinar. So I better check into IPOs again, and then lo and behold, she picked up a couple of good trades. So there's going to be great trading opportunities in the future. So it's good to learn now. Now I've got a few things. You're going to see a few things blocked out. Uh, it was just a lot easier than going in. And what I did was I compressed several hundred slides down to about 50 or 60, and then at that point, it was easier in a lot of these just to kind of block things out. Uh, but there are some things that I, I, want to, I do want to cover tonight that I will be also covering uh, on July 12th. Uh, if you wanted to find a public offering, ideally it's, it's within the last 100 days is what I consider a public offering. That's within the last three months or so, and that's where most of your tradable patterns are. But there are some longer-term opportunities and these stocks, in fact, when they, they're a little bit further out from that IPO date, that initial public offering date, I call those toddlers. And there are some, some good patterns that occur within the toddlers that could make them worthwhile. And then they fit a little bit more in with the core methodology. Sometimes with the core methodology, it's easier to capture the longer-term trends because you might have, I don't want to digress too far, so it's kind of like, well, Dave, you're on fire for IPOs. Is IPOs the only thing? No. IPOs is an important part of what we do, and you can make a lot of money at IPOs, but it's also important to trade the core methodology because 
that little solar stock might shoot up as an IPO. You might make a little money on it. But then 10 years from now, it might get its act together, okay, like the SPWR did a couple of, uh, I think it was in 2012, and that's gone up about 500 to 600% since then. So those longer-term sustainable moves are still possible with the core methodology. They're a little bit harder to catch in the IPOs. It's like ideally, you know, logically you think I'm going to get in the ground floor, and you do, and you capture that big, huge move, but a lot of times it doesn't pan out at least not longer term, because you're going to have some deep retrace, but you're going to have that fly and die, and that's going to occur quite a bit. There are other patterns that occur, but that fly and die is one of the more common ones. Now, the question is, should you buy them right out the gate, okay? Got a company that comes public today, should I buy it? And the answer is no. You need to wait and see how that stock's going to trade in the open market. Now, here's an example, Rin Rin. This is a Chinese social networking company. Some of you may have heard of it. I certainly never heard of it until it came public. Okay, And you can see it comes public on this day here. And then what happens? It just implodes. So you might be thinking, all right, Dave, well, that sounds kind of obscure. It's a Chinese social networking company. Show me something a little less obscure. Well, how about Facebook? This was the most highly anticipated IPO in the history of the world. Everybody that brother was talking about Facebook before it came public. And then look what happened. If you'd have bought it and opened it today, you would have lost about half your money over the next few weeks to a month, okay, before it started to bottom out. But by that time, you would have been a fool to hold on to it, okay? So the market is the final arbiter. We're not going to speculate on what's going to happen back here, although there are some things that it doesn't hurt to understand about the BPO, the before public offering. It doesn't hurt to understand some of these things. In fact, it will help you to understand what's happening in the aftermarket, okay, or the uh, APO market, the public uh, offering market. Okay, This is the real market. This is the stock that begins to trade in here. And then we're only going to take trades after this particular time frame, and there's some specific patterns we're going to look for. It is not worthwhile trading them early in the process. But the great news is you don't have to wait that long. Now, some of you, or if you've been coming to my weekly chart shows, you probably know I've been talking about sardines for quite some time. So bear with me because we do have some new people in here tonight. The old sardine story, if you read enough trading books, you probably have come across it in one form or the other. I don't remember if I read it in Jesse Livermore's books, which it probably makes sense because he has a lot of anecdotal. anecdotal. I don't know, is that a word, anecdotal? He has a lot of anecdotes in his books, and um, I never claim to be an expert in English. <laughs> I'm Cajun, so English is my second language, but um, we'll just make words up. Uh, anyway, the sardine story. The sardine story is that there was a bubble in sardines, and tens of sardines started going up astronomically in price, and people were trading the sardine tens. And one guy decides, you know what? I paid a lot of money for these sardines. I'm going to sit down and have me a little lunch, a very expensive lunch, but a little lunch at that. And he popped up the sardines, and they were rotten. So he tracks down the guy he bought them from, and the guy says, silly fool. Those sardines are for trading and not eating. So we are trading sardines. We are not eating them. We are trading IPOs. Okay? We're not investing in them. Although we hope, and I hate to use the word hope in this business, but we hope it becomes the next big thing. And if and when it does, you made your year, maybe your decade, okay? That's possible. But I don't want to make that sound like that's going to be the norm, okay? That's going to be pretty elusive. So we're mostly trading these IPOs and not eating them, okay? So when the time, when the time comes, be willing to say so long and thanks for all the fish. Runs up 100%, it comes back and knocks you out, you make 80% of the trade. <laughs> you do that on every trade. You're going to own the world pretty quick, okay? So be willing to say so long and thanks for all the fish. 
This is a sign. I took a, I grabbed my cell phone, took a picture of it right before the webinar. This is a sign I have mounted in my office, Sardine Drive. Okay, I have it over a big television that I use as an ancillary monitor for charts. I like to look at um, big charts sometimes on the monitor. The TV, this big TV I have, it's 65 inches, I think, or 60 something inches. It's, it's too big for my office, but it was a hand me down from the house, so it's uh, it's in here. Anywho, uh, I use it as an extra monitor. I don't watch any news, and I don't pay attention to any news, and, and some, sometimes I get in some heated debates with people that I should be more aware of what's going on. In fact, I didn't even know who the Fed chairman was, the new Fed chairman. I, I thought it was Bernanke still. I had no idea it was this, um, this lady until uh, last Friday. So that's how isolated I keep myself. But anyway, I digress. Above that big monitor, so to speak, in my office, is this sardine drive sign and I don't want to digress too far but I would recommend in your your trading room or wherever you trade from have some symbolism like that that reminds you you were here to trade and you're here to make money you're not here to be right or look like a hero you are here to make money and that's the only reason you should ever trade a stock. So get you a sardine drive sign and put it up in your office. A couple of ground rules. Uh, long only. The idea is to ride the euphoria. You can't short them anyway unless you're an insider. It gets kind of technical, okay? That They're not marginable at first. And so as a private trader, you can pretty much forget about shorting them anyway. Um, the holding time, uh, I have some a few things to say about the holding time, but let's just say at least until they begin to smell. Okay, and as I said earlier, we're not going to completely abandon the, the core methodology. But what I'm going to show you is that we're going to keep that core methodology and embrace it, especially for the secondary signals. But for the first signals, the pioneer signals that I'm going to talk a little bit about in a minute, we're going to uh, sort of bend that methodology a little bit. We're also going to be a little bit more flexible with the methodology, which I'm going to show you. And I already sort of showed you earlier. Notice that pullback we had in an RLYP, which was in the trading service earlier this year, was uh, like 13 days in the pullback, which is a little bit longer than the normal five, six, seven, eight days that we normally trade. So we're going to bend the methodology a little bit. <laughs> Lucia, I have, I have an antidote. Oh, okay, cool. I guess it's about the antidotes, right? Uh, oh, before we look at how, and I'm going to show you a few ways to, to trade some IPOs and ways to think about them. Uh, again, there's no pesky fundamentals. This is the why. And this is something I think right here makes a lot of sense. And every time I read this, it's, it just makes me excited that I wrote it. It's like the euphoria is a bigger motivator than reality. So let me say that again. Euphoria is a much bigger motivator than reality. And that's what we're trading. We're trading the promise of the future, and that's why in, in, in the title of this webinar, it's called The Promise of the Future, and we're going to capitalize on that promise. And there are people with a vested interest that are warning the IPO to succeed. Not enough time to get in all the players tonight, but trust me, there's a lot of people out there that want them to succeed. Did I say manipulation? No, of course not. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, and then there's a f quite a few other reasons to trade IPOs, but I'm going to hit the, the big ones tonight, or I have already hit them. Again, they have a story to sell. They're going to cure some hard disease. They're going to solve the world's energy crisis, and it could be less lofty, but certainly important goals, such as making good burritos or making comfortable exercise clothes for guys like Big Dave who eat too many burritos. So it doesn't always have to be a save the world type of thing when it comes to IPOs. I learned my lesson with Lulumon uh, a few years back. You guys in the service, you may remember this. I showed Lulumon as a beautiful secondary type of setup, meaning like a first pullback type of setup in an IPO. And I laugh and said, oh, it's a beautiful setup, but they make yoga clothes. Ha, 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 ha. And then I watched in anguish as it went up about 40% in the next week. So that was a valuable lesson for me when I should have known better about uh, four or five years ago. So since then, I don't care anymore. I only care about 
capitalizing on that promise, capitalizing on that big run, at least in that fly phase, when it occurs in these IPOs. So don't worry too much about the reality. What is, is, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is, and focus on what's actually going on in the market. Um, I want to touch real quick upon efficiency. We spent a lot of time in the Stock Selection webinar talking about this. I just want to give you a couple of highlights on efficiency. Efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into a market, so you foolishly think that you could beat the market. And, and they're right to a certain extent when it comes to very efficient stocks. If you look at a uh, Walmart or some of these big, large, huge companies, they just tend to chop around a lot. They don't move that much. However, if you look at some of these IPOs, they obviously, they move, okay? They go straight up. They go straight down. But they don't chop around sideways, at least not for long. So even if you don't didn't know anything about efficiency, just know that IPOs are very inefficient. And there's a few things that makes up that make up efficient markets. Let's say Forex. You're trading Forex. That's an extremely efficient market. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and yens and rubles and all these other currencies are traded hands every day. That's a very, very, very much efficient market. These IPOs can be extremely inefficient. Now, what makes inefficiency? Inefficiency, again, means everything isn't priced in. They run up 100%. That 100% run was not priced into the stock. So smaller cap stocks, a lot of IPOs, very low in volume. We're not going to get into volume tonight, but very low in volume. They're unknown, okay, whereas efficient st stocks are going to be larger cap and they're going to be known. Uh, efficient stocks are going to be very low in volatility. The IPO is going to be higher in volatility, much higher. And then you have what I call quantifiable fundamentals in here. And as a general statement in IPOs and slash inefficient stocks, you have no or little quantifiable fundamentals. And the reason that is is that the company is coming public to raise money to do something. So they either have bad fundamentals, okay, or they have no fundamentals, and they need that money to make those burritos, to cure that disease, or to satisfy whatever that next fad may be. So that's inefficiency. So IPOs are wildly inefficient, and that is a good thing. Now, keep in mind that efficiency is a moving target, and efficient stocks can sometimes make inefficient moves. Those are a couple of concepts you gotta have to wrap your head around. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this webinar, but let's say you do see one of these very efficient uh, companies making an all-time high. They begin to roll over, make something like a bow tie. That could turn into an inefficient move. Same thing might happen in Forex, okay? Now, as far as efficiency being the moving target, as that euphoria wanes with the company, okay, as they begin to produce some earnings or fundamentals or lack thereof down the road, and they begin to get scrutinized, then they're going to become more efficient, okay? But early on, very inefficient. Very hard for people to put a price on them. The euphoria of the players coming in often lifts them higher. The manipulation, as we say here in Cajun land, helps to lift them higher. And there's some wonderful trading opportunities that can happen, especially when you get that first big leg out. Now, there's a couple of other common patterns that we're not going to get into tonight, and there's five of them total. But I do want to talk, again, a little bit more about the fly and die and what happens, because that's going to be your bread and butter probably for the most part, okay? And then the other thing to remember is that a significant high or low is often set within the first week of trading. I'm going to come back to that in just one second, okay? The most common pattern is big picture pattern number two, which I've been beating a dead horse on all night to fly and die. Now, this doesn't mean you can't trade this. You might have a primary signal here or a pioneer signal. You might have secondary signals throughout. You could have multiple trades in this phase. And like I said, go back and we'll look at those charts. We'll take a look at the recordings uh, uh, after um, tonight, and we'll see what kind of moves we had in some of those flies and dies I picked. And trust me, I just picked a few of them. I have a lot more to show you 
uh, on July 12th in, in, in the big webinar, but I just picked a few to show you tonight. So it's not like, hey, Dave, you cherry-picked a few stocks. There just were a plethora of stocks from back in late, late last year, early this year. And then, you know what? There's still quite a few more that are – that could be doing the same thing now. There's quite a few that took off that I showed you earlier, and they might end up doing the fly and die phase, okay? Now, one thing that happens, just, just to kind of wrap your head around it, and again, the market is always the final arbiter, but sometimes it helps to wrap your head around things a little bit to understand what's going on, okay? I don't worry about that nearly as much as I used to. I try not to even think about it. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, I ignore the news. I try to trade it in vacuum. Uh, my news comes uh, from osmosis. That's the only time I ever get any news. I don't care so much about how things work. I just care about empirically empir empirical evidence. If I see a pattern that occurs over and over and over again, and it's tradable, that's all I care about. But some people need to kind of wrap their heads around what's going on, and it, it never hurts, okay? So this is a pretty good slide, and you could take this slide for the other three or four, was it four different other patterns, and you could move these uh, lines around. And I'm just going to focus on this one for tonight. So you've got this enthusiasm. It comes public, and usually the enthusiasm goes up for a while, and then the price goes up with enthusiasm as the demand increases. Now, reality begins to increase, too, and people begin to pick the company apart. You also have a quiet period that ends. We're going to talk about that a lot, too. And when that quiet period ends, now the good news is usually the less noise, the better. And this is true, but when that quiet period ends, guess what they come out with? They come out with a bullish report. Oh, lo and behold, okay? All this stuff, believe it or not, was set up way back here, okay? Now, I don't want to get too far into that conspiracy theory of manipulation, but I guarantee you, when you see these IPOs, when that quiet period is lifted, the first thing that come out is this glowing report, and you're going to see price many times is, is going to spike higher. Unless, of course, somebody's on the hook, which we're going to mention just a little bit in a second, and looking to get out on that spike. But anyway, if you have to wrap your head around it, just know that that reality begins to set in, and that enthusiasm begins to, rain, uh, begins to wane. Now, price, again, is the ultimate arbiter. So what happens when that price rolls over? We get stopped out, and we're out of the trade, and so long, and thanks for all the fish is what I like to say at that point, okay? The fly and die is the most common tradable pattern, okay? So the wild enthusiasm phase is the fly phase. That's that, okay? There's a lot of good trades that could be had. Again, there's some pioneer trades that are way back here, very early in the cycle. I don't want to give it away too much, but there's some very good trades way back here. And even if you don't go away with anything tonight, other than the fact that you take that first little pullback, that could be a wonderful trade in and of itself, okay? In fact, that could be such a good bread and butter trade. I think if all you did was that in IPOs, I think you'd be very successful. Even though there's some tremendous patterns back here, I think your takeaway tonight would be just at least go in and look to trade that one pattern. And then this makes it even better, these pioneer type of signals. Again, I can't emphasize the word trade enough. These are truly sardines. You have to, the reason I'm beating a dead horse on this is you have to have this antiseptic mentality when it comes to trading. You cannot be attached. You cannot care. If it doesn't work, the heck with it. And if it works, then that's awesome. And you can't get to you for, to you for it when it works. It's weird. It's like when trades work, I don't get excited. When trades don't work, I get mad. So it's like I can never be really happy. But in the long run, I'm happy as long as I look at things on a net net basis. So there's a lot of psychology, obviously, when it comes to trading. And we're going to talk about that sardine psychology, too, and I'm going to beat the dead horse even more on that. And once again, I can't emphasize enough, that fly part is very substantial and it's very worthwhile. So here's a real example with fly and die. And if you look at all these, most of these fly and die patterns, you can see some of these secondary signals in here. And there certainly were some pioneer signals in these fly and die patterns in every single one of them tonight. And that's the point I'm trying to make. If, that, if the market is going to go from A to C, it's got to go through B to get there. And that B trade could be pretty darn 
good. And then subsequent secondary signals like this TKO here or this pullback here could also make for some wonderful trades. Okay. And sometimes there's some other things they do bigger picture wise after the fly, which could be tradable. And we'll get into that later. But you have breakouts here. This thing is ran up nicely, pull back, take it off again, coming in. But this might not be the end of this IPO. It might have another leg in it. And it might be a fairly low risk way to get in on a possible longer term trades. Now, I was thinking about this. I think Will Rogers would have been a very successful IPO trader because we all know the old saying, he said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, that sounds like a yogiism, but if you're trading IPOs, it's really not. If you buy IPOs, that are going up after sufficient of enough time in the open market and provide you got a setup, you're going to be surprised how many early ones you can catch and catch that big, nice euphoric phase out. And many a times they either work or they don't. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to buy the fly and avoid the die. And there are many ways to avoid the die. Here's an IPO came out. Its first day was its all-time high, and then has never seen that level since. Okay. Now there are some players, and there's some before public offering mechanics. But always remember, the market is the final arbiter. Never forget that. I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay. Hey, uh, Lucio, uh, do me a favor. Look up that quote from Greg and uh, about um, trend, what the trend will bear, so I, I can quote him properly. Anyway, understanding the players and mechanics could help you get a feel for what might be going on and, again, kind of wrap your head around that. And then, as I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts. And you can go to www.dontconfuse. T H E I S S U E dot C O M, and that'll help you from confusing the issue with facts. You could also go to do not confuse the issue with facts dot com. Okay, so again, to beat that dead horse, the market is the final arbiter. You got a setup, you take it. Okay, you're trading sardines, you're not attached to them, you don't care about them. Okay. Mentality of insiders. There's a certain mentality of those who are insiders, and then there's various levels of the insiders. So I'm using this as a general term tonight. We'll dig a little deeper into the who the players are, but let's just say the lower-tiered insiders are very much encouraged not to flip the issue, meaning that they want these guys to hold on and don't put any selling pressure, at least not initially, okay? Otherwise, they're not going to get shares in the future, and we'll talk a lot more about that. And there's some things that happen after the um, lockup period, okay? Now, there's some players here before the public offering. We'll get into all that. There's the greed shoe. There's the BPO buyers. There's company insiders. There's a lot that goes on that can affect the price of the stock. Again, the market is a final arbiter, but it does help to understand what could be going on within the company. There's a lot of people that are on the hook back here before the public offering. The beauty of the pub the beauty of an IPO is that there are no bad memories, meaning there's no overhead resistance. Okay? So let's say you're trading some stock and there's a bunch of trading up here. Stock drops, makes a nice little setup. You're like, oh I'm gonna go long. Well guess what? As soon as it hits that overhead resistance people that bought the stock in that range are going to be looking to get off the hook, okay? But you don't have that with IPOs. Now, you do have some people looking to get off the hook, and maybe it's a little too academic to talk about them, but again, it does help to kind of wrap your head around what's going on when that little, with that little 
graph I did earlier with the sardine and the, and the enthusiasm and the reality. Okay. Now there's a couple of assumptions. Underwriters will support the issue. Okay. They get paid to make the IPO work. Okay. And then insiders have a vested interest. Duh. So they want it to succeed too. So there is going to be some manipulation that happens. Legal manipulation. A um, couple of random thoughts. Here's one thing that's kind of beautiful about the IPOs is that the little guy has a certain advantage. Uh, if you're an RIA and you're trying to run some money, not so easy to um, to trade a little IPO. But if you're a private trader, you could take a stab at a very thin issue. Now, I don't recommend you go after an issue that's too thin, and that's something we'll get into, and I'll show you some ways to gauge that too. But you could certainly go in and trade stocks that the big boys can't play. And here's the beauty too, like something like that AGRX, I got in that stock, and all of a sudden the volume just swelled, and now all of a sudden it's trading like a big stock. So as a little guy, you can go in and get in really early if the pattern's there, okay? It's not without risk, okay? All, all this stuff does have risk, but the opportunity, I think, far outweighs it. Now, there is uh, the emotional nature of them makes them great trading vehicles. Always remember that technical analysis is nothing more than reading the emotions of the market through charts. Don't get caught up in the, don't you draw on that 15th oscillator, are you counting some kind of wave or something? Forget about all that. Look at the charts and realize that your job is look at the charts, see what people have done, see exactly what they have done in the past, and think about what they might be motivated to do in the future. And that's your 100%, that's all, 100% of what you should do is look at the charts. Okay, be very careful if you start adding in a bunch of indicators and make that technical analysis into some sort of mumbo jumbo, which it's not. So the pure emotional nature of these guys can make them great trading vehicles. Now, if anybody reads Chinese, you might know what I've put in, in here in the analogy I'm trying to make. Um, the bottom line, though, is they're riskier, but the reward outweighs the risk. We get paid to put capital in harm's way. If you're trading IPOs, I can guarantee that's one thing I can guarantee you is that you are putting capital in harm's way. But the chance for reward on the euphoria, especially right now, while we're in a bull market in IPOs, makes it all worth while okay uh, there's quite a few caveats and random thoughts and you know me I, I, I'm Mr. Rant man and I could go on and on for days I know we only have an hour tonight but just a couple things or one thing that I wanted to point out there's a self-policing aspect that means that might be few if not any to trade in less than ideal conditions but that's okay now what does that mean well Go back to 2008, and while the market was tanking, I bet there weren't a whole lot of IPOs, okay? So you're getting ready to bring your company public, and all of a sudden the market begins to implode. What are you going to do? You're going to wait. So they're doing a little market timing for you. You'd be surprised at how many people trade in crappy markets, okay? People who should know better. Because they want to be a hero. They want to be right. They're not worried about making money. They want to be right. They want to try to catch that bottom look like a hero. But these IPO people are smart enough to say, wait a minute. We're going to get a bad price for our company. If we could hold off six months and wait for this market to turn around and wait for that market to perform a little better, we'll take our company public then. So they're doing the market timing for you to some aspect. Okay. Now, how to trade IPOs. I want to show you, uh, I'll give you a takeaway tonight, one good takeaway in this first pullbacks. Uh, there's also, like I said, exceptions to the core methodology, meaning that we might go uh, 13 days in the pullback instead of 7, 8, or 9. We're also going to trade some patterns without giving too much away. That might be a little bit breakout in nature. Breakouts don't work. It's kind of like... It's kind of like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. Everybody knows that. You know, it's like, uh, I see potentially you and you. And, you know, everybody knows he's a bad motivational speaker. Well, everybody knows that breakouts don't work. And the reason everybody knows that breakouts don't work is because 
everybody has a computer on the desk. When that breakout happens, everybody and their brother sees it. Well, everybody and their brother sees it on an efficient market, okay? Forex, uh, big, thick stock, the market overall for that matter, okay? Go back and look at the S&Ps of the last three, four months. How many false breakouts did we have? before the darn thing finally broke out. We had a plethora of them. But the good thing in these IPOs, there's so much going on from an emotional standpoint, from a manipulation standpoint, okay, that these breakout type of patterns can work. And then there's also, uh, you know, when you start, the beauty of what I do, and, and, and I'm blessed because I'm able to have an educational business, I'm able to trade on my own, and then I'm able to, um, Let's use the word consult. I, I don't know if I'm legally allowed to use the word advice, but a consult, okay? And I get paid to do all those things. And in the when I put together a webinar, I learn so much on my own. I know it's kind of from a selfish standpoint, but one thing I'm seeing is that there are some possible longer-term deep, deep retracements, which are possible fodder for research, where you have the fly, you have the die, and then you have... Uh, well, I'll give it away. It's a fly, slide, and glide. That's another one of those patterns. You have the fly, you have the slide, and then the glide. And I think that's wonderful fodder for research. Um, until I actually execute trades, actual trades in my own account, I do not recommend any sort of um, I'm saying, my personal research for you. Unless I'm personally doing it, I do not recommend it. Uh, so until I get some trades under my belt doing this, which I might be able to do between now and July 12th, then it won't be fodder for research. It'll be actual pattern that can be trading. Again, as a technician's dream, uh, if you're going to get to C, you got to go through B, okay? So these pioneer patterns, it's like the American pioneers. You either get the gold or you get the arrows in your back, okay? Here's the beauty, though. Many will just fail. They die and they die and they never trigger a pioneer pattern. And this is the closest thing to a toaster that I have ever seen in markets, at least when you're in an IPO bull market, okay? Uh, if you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. That's, that's an old kind of flippant saying in the trading world, and it cannot be more true, okay? If you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. But this is the closest thing to a toaster that I've ever seen. And it virtually guarantees, I can't ever 100% guarantee anything, but it virtually guarantees you're going to be on board Anything that skyrockets in a market, and there's three of these pioneer patterns that I'm going to get into. Uh, just your takeaway, one of your takeaways for tonight, just know that the significant high or low is often set during the first week of trading. Well, how do you use that? Well, know that after a week, it's either going to fly, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, or it's going to die. You could use this to your advantage, okay? There are pioneer patterns back here. Okay, which helps to get you in that fly phase. Okay, and guess what? Those same patterns are not going to trigger you in most, not all, but most of the die phases. And here's the other thing that I'm going to that I'm very excited to show is: let's say you do get triggered in. A lot of times you'll have enough initial rally to either a get to the profit target or b close enough to where you can at least trail that stop higher. It stop out at a scratch or a small loss. Yes, there will be losses. Okay, that's the only thing I can guarantee. But these pioneer patterns again are the closest thing to a toaster that I've seen that you could have guarantees. And there are certain times where you don't want to buy just because you have the trigger. And I've got the chart blacked out, blacked out because I know you engineering types, engineering types in here are going to look at it and figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> so. Again, here's another example. You get a setup back here, okay? What happens? Never triggers. Stock loses 50% of its value. You're going to be surprised how often that occurs, okay? Now, you're probably looking at this one. If you've got good eyes or a big monitor, you say, hey, wait a minute, Dave. Didn't that touch that entry? It's like, well, there's another. The entry is here, but there's another qualification. It's a very simple qualification for these pioneer type of patterns and it never did trigger based on that. There's also some other reasons that you would want to be more selective in this particular issue. Okay. Now here's a good takeaway pattern. Your first pullback and 
you want to see a, an IPO make a significant rally. And remember in the stock webinar, for those of you who were there, we talked about the acceleration of trade. You obviously want to see it, or ideally you want to see it accelerating higher. And then you look to trade that first pullback. Very powerful, very easy to recognize pattern. And it's a great place for a second chance. If you missed the first entry in one of these pioneer patterns, this is a great place to get in to a second trade. And it's going to be a good fallback when breakouts aren't working as well. Right now, breakouts are printing money, okay? This, this one specific pattern that I have is printing money right now. I can't guarantee that it will always do that. In fact, I can guarantee it won't always do that. Right now, it's working exceptionally well. But what's going to happen is when it stops working so well, you're probably entering a bear market phase in the market, or you're probably be, you're entering, a, entering a less speculative phase. Remember a couple of months ago, we were in this stupid phase of the market where people wanted to buy all these boring stocks like utilities and, and foods, and it's like, and that's the only stocks they wanted to buy. When you're in a defensive phase like that, sometimes the speculation leaves the market, okay? And it's sometimes you can have a crazy market. I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but sometimes you can have a crazy market where you have an, I, you have an IPO bull market, and then the overall market is super defensive, and these speculative stocks are the only stocks that are moving, okay? But let's say the overall conditions do worsen. That's one caveat I will tell you is these breakouts won't work quite as well as they were. So what will happen is that you could go in and trade that, that first pullback. So let's say you miss the breakout pattern back here, okay? You wait for that first pullback and you get in. The question is, will it, will the, uh, yeah, the um, webinar will be recorded, okay? And the recordings are the same price as the, um, as the live webinar. And if you go to the webinar, there's follow-up sessions, and those follow-up sessions will also be recorded. So first pullback's a great place, great secondary pattern to come back to when the IPO, uh, when breakouts aren't working as well. Here's another example of a first pullback. This is the RLYP. And even a second pullback in here would have made you some money on that trade. So you can see that they work really well until they don't in a lot of cases. This is a little older example, but um, this was back in 2013 when these little solar companies were on fire. This one didn't do a whole lot, but guess what? Longer term, it worked out pretty darn well. And this is a case where it did actually work. You did get in the ground floor with an IPO. And if you were able to just be patient, it paid off tremendously longer term. And here's a dated example, but you can see this first little pullback in here, okay? You had to wait about two months for something to happen in this one. And then you had pioneer patterns here, okay? But your first pullback was still a very worthwhile trade in this issue until it eventually came back in, okay? All right, so what, tell me about the webinar. Well, that's what I'm hoping you're saying by now. Uh, there's going to be eight hours total, and then it's going to be another two hours for whoever wants to come to the introduction seminar. The introduction seminar, I'm going to spend two hours talking about the core methodology. We're going to bend the rules a little bit in the core methodology, but again, you have to know the core methodology going in, or just a little bit about it. It's, and it's not that tough. If you understand entries and stops and pullbacks, I mean, this is going to be really basic. We're going to talk sardines. We're going to talk stick figures. It's going to be really basic, but you'll have a good understanding of methodology, and the IPO patterns will make a lot more sense. There's uh, three other big picture patterns I want to cover. There's a lot more specific patterns. We're going to talk more about what goes on behind the scene. Money management is crucial. Position management is crucial. There's important parameters such as volume. Uh, very simple techniques and tricks to find IPOs. I can show you that. A lot of pitfalls to avoid. And you can avoid that die and die for the most part by using certain pitfalls and secondary uh, parameters, and I'll get into that. Uh, we're going to discuss potential and live trades. So in the follow-up se on the session on July 12th, we're going to find some potential trades, and we're going to see how they shake out. And then in the follow-up sessions, we'll take a look at some live trades and see how they shake out. Okay? Um, with everything I do, I give unlimited, within reason, lifetime support. Okay? So if you want to ask me about an IPO, because this is an IPO webinar, 10 years from now, if you want to ask me, that's fine. But phrase it like, okay, I'm looking at this one. This is what I'm thinking. This is why I'm thinking this. 
give me all the details and don't just say, hey, what do you think about X, Y, Z, okay? Uh, obviously, we're going to get into the sardine psychology. And then, of course, there's much, much more. So uh, it's on my website under IPO webinar. And there's a lot of good information just on that one page there. And I'm going to put the um, – my cage just slipped out. I said, dare. Um, I'm going to put – I'm going to take this paragraph out, and I'm going to put the link to tonight's show after our process is recorded. Give me a day or so to process that. So if you want to go back and watch it, that recording will be up here. And if once you listen to that recording, even, the, even though it was kind of a bit of a teaser, I know, you can come back in and look at some of the things I'm talked about in here. You can see here's a fly and a die. And then you can see that these are just IPOs, and these are the max gains based on the patterns. These are pioneer patterns and diverse pullback patterns. These are the gains. And what's amazing to me is this kind of blows me away. The maximum loss from the entry is just very tiny in here. And this is that work or they don't thing, which is so exciting about them. Again, they're not always going to work. We're not buying toasters, right, with a guarantee. But when they don't work, a lot of times, the, uh, the, 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 well, if they don't work, you get stopped out. But when they work, a lot of times your max loss from the entry is very small. You get in, and then they take off. And then, again, there's a lot of times you can avoid a losing trade simply by waiting for an entry. And believe me, a lot of them die, okay? Here's some recent ones when I was putting together this uh, marketing slide, and you can see all the losses and all of these occur occurred and not one of them triggered in here. And there's some things that are going on behind the scene we'll talk about, about what happens with those particular issues. Anyway, um, it's going to go up 100 bucks. I think, the week before. So we got an early bird special here, uh, 2.97. So, it, again, it's going to be four hours on Saturday, July 12th, okay? And then there's going to be, I forget how many, four follow-up sessions, I think. Four follow-up sessions, yeah over the next uh, couple of months. If we get a lot of action, we'll have a setup, we'll have a follow-up session every week. If the market kind of dies out a little bit, we'll maybe go every other week or every third week on those follow-ups to make sure we get some some IPOs in the process, okay? Uh, any questions? Okay. I'll let everybody think for a minute, usually. Nothing comes in, and then, uh, okay, website address is davelandry.com, and then you should be two clicks away from everything. Uh, this is the new webinar down here. This is the countdown, 16 days, 15 hours, 2 minutes, and then you can click here if you want for IPO webinar. Um, if you are new to me, I know there's some new faces in here tonight. Welcome aboard. Uh, click on the free newsletter. Uh, pretty good information if I say so myself in that. And by the way, there's tons and tons and tons of free stuff on my website. If you click here for free videos, I'll have tonight's video in there, which is a bit of a teaser, I realize. But then there's a bunch of weekly charts in here. I do an hour and a half chart show every week, and that's completely free. And I'll take questions on anything, and I'll answer them uh, regarding trading at least. Okay. Okay, you didn't find it. It's a... Uh, the market will the market would only bear the fundamentals. I got his book right here. I'll, t I'll see if I can find it. I've got it so dog eared I'll never find the page. <laughs> it's funny, I had that that's one of the quotes that I quote often. It's on the tip of my tongue, of course. Once once the spotlight's on you, it's a little Oh, right, here we go. Uh, remember, all the financial theories and all of the fundamentals will never be any better than what the trend of the markets will allow. So that's very, uh, very good advice. Oh, what page? I just closed the book. <laughs> it's on page uh, 139, last, um, last line. That's Greg's book, Investing with the Trend. Good book, by the way. Uh, you can get it, the link to that. It's on my website. I, he's been coming up quite a bit in my um, webinars lately. Okay. Thank you, Ronald. Appreciate it. Ronald says, nice uh, presentation. Lucio says, gracias. Uh, okay. What pattern did King Entertainment IPO follow, and what do you project for the future with regard to this stock? All right, we'll pull that up real quick. Does the actual dollar amount of the IPO have any significance? Yes. 
Yes, and that's something that we're going we're to cover in a lot of detail. Obviously, you want to avoid penny stocks, but there's some other caveats in there, okay? King. Let's see what we got. Uh, no, you would, you would never have triggered into this particular stock, okay? No. No, you would never have triggered into it. In fact, this would probably come off your radar. I mean, there's one pattern that could still occur in this, but uh, for the most part, probably not. Fred says, nice teaser. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I appreciate you being here, especially um, after we all work long days. I appreciate you being here uh, and showing up. So thank you so much. Maggie says, do the website. Great information. Thanks for the webinar. You're welcome, Maggie. Reality. <laughs> the question is, uh, once I sign up, can I have access to the past videos? Um, yeah, contact me offline. I'm trying to think of what... Uh, videos that would be yeah if you sign up for the webinar you get all of the videos whether you can make them live or not and then you could also what some people do because a lot of you guys are out I know busy saving lives and building buildings training dogs preparing automatic transmissions and doing other great things and you can't make these live shows so yeah absolutely you have access to all the live shows but a lot of people who are real busy what they'll do is before the next show they'll say Dave I need you to cover this and I will gladly cover it in the next webinar, and I do that all the time. I do that in my free webinars too, not just the paid stuff. Okay, you got the answer. Okay, good. All right, fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Again, thanks everyone. Uh, everybody have a great night. Any questions? I answer all of my emails. David Dave Lander com. So everybody have a fantastic night, and I uh, hope to see you guys on July 12th. Also, free webinar Thursday doing today. It's a week of charts. I do those every week, and they're always free. So feel free to stop by. Thank you so much.